Um, now I'll move on to my next talk, <laughs> uh, which I was, I was uh, giving a talk now on best practices, so accepted use criteria and standardized reporting. This will overlap a little bit uh, with the talk two prior or three prior, but hopefully it will highlight some important differences. And again, in this setting, there'll be a little bit of a U.S. centricity because some of these things about what an AUC is comes out of uh, laws in the United States, et cetera. So, Disclosures again. So appropriate or accepted use. Um, there are a lot of these out there. Uh, there are an enormous, I don't even know what some of these acronyms mean, uh, but people are tripping over themselves to write guidelines which say, yeah, you should use PSMA PET. Right? That's in essence what's happening. And in essence, it seems that the order in which they come out defines what they say. So like the ASCO guidelines were written a long time ago before PSMA PET was FDA approved. And they're very cautious about the wording they use because it wasn't approved. And they, they're not going to update that. Whereas you know, the SNMMI guidelines, which you just heard about in the last talk and the one I'm going to talk about here, is post-approval. So it has a very sort of different approach. Um, this is our SMMI guidelines that we put together. Appropriate use in the United States has a defined meaning. Okay, when you say uh, appropriate use criteria, this is legislated by Medicare. So there was an act passed in 2014 which stated that anytime you use a very expensive imaging modality, you have to refer to an appropriate use guideline uh, in order to determine whether or not you can get reimbursed for that imaging agent in that setting. So FDG PET, MRI, CT, uh, any PET radio pharmaceuticals have to have an AUC uh, or else you don't get reimbursed. Now it keeps getting delayed when it's going to go into effect, but theoretically, January. 2023 is when Medicare will require you to use AUC criteria, advanced decision support, in order to get reimbursed for advanced imaging studies. And I don't think it will get delayed this time unless there's another COVID pandemic, which pushes everything out, which maybe it will happen. But uh, that is the motivation and the background as to why this exists. And it's a very structured process. We vote on it in a cyclic process, create consensus with a group of experts that has to include various specialties, etc. And I actually really enjoy this process. Primarily primarily because it wasn't dominated by nuclear medicine physicians. There were surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and the discussion is very educational when you sit down and go through these, or these indications, as you'll see. So the first five indications were initial staging indications. Um, we sort of saw this earlier, and we agreed upon that newly diagnosed unfavorable intermediate high-risk and very high-risk patients, and then also those patients who are negative or oligomastatic on conventional imaging should be imaged with PSMA PET. Now, it's interesting to a certain extent because the uh, studies that supported scenario three and four didn't really include unfavorable versus favorable intermediate risk. There's actually no data on the use of PSMA PET stratified between favorable and unfavorable. The way that came out is in essence to match NCCN guidelines, which you know has CT bone scan in their prior edition in patients who are unfavorable and not in favorable. And so we were trying to replace uh, CT and bone scan because there's obviously no role for that. So it's sort of a weird uh, backing into it. Like if you look at the uh, Osprey trial, they didn't include intermediate risk patients at all in that trial. And in the UCSF, UCLA study, we had very few intermediate risk patients to actually support that indication. So it's sort of interesting, you know, it's expert opinion and that's how it rolled in there. I would note that uh, scenario one, in patients who don't really yet have a diagnosis, it was graded as being rarely approached. So anything six or lower is, should not be used. Uh, and I will be intrigued to see how uh, Oh my goodness, I'm blanking on your trial all of a sudden. I've heard it 12 times uh, in the last three days. Uh, but primary two and primary one impact uh, the United States side of things for the use of PSMA PET uh, prior to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. I think biochemical recurrence indications are very straightforward. Everyone agrees upon the use of using PSMA PET and biochemical recurrence. I think the interesting thing is no guideline has really stuck a uh, criteria of PSA cutoff for what is biochemical recurrence. And, and we, you know, I personally think it should not go in a guideline because every patient's different and a PSA of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 is very different depending on PSA doubling times, age, other risk factors, et cetera. And so we've obviously gone out of the way not to put that into these guidelines and sort of leave it over to the physician about how to use it. Um, and then CRPC indications, uh, scenario nine there. You know, I, I like scenario nine because it came out of work that we've all done collectively. Uh, you know, Dr. Fendler in the last talk, two talks ago, showed uh, the collaborative research that we did showing the uh, incidence of metastatic disease in patients who are M0 CRPC on conventional imaging. And I think what's more important is not the M1 disease, it's the percent of patients who have oligometastatic disease. If it was just the fact everyone had METs, then it wouldn't matter. 
right? Because you're still going to go to systemic therapy. And so who cares if you get a PSMA PET to show that someone has metastatic disease? The thing that's changing is whether or not there's a role in SBRT or RT in M0CRPC patients. And that's not yet fully defined how you do that. But at least the fact that you're seeing oligomet patients in this earlier stage of M0CRPC potentially is a place where you could get clinical benefit from radiation, external beam radiation therapy. And that's why we graded that as appropriate. In the patients who have metastatic disease but have a PSA rise, the use of PSMA PET's unclear. And as a response to therapy, uh, we thought that there was no evidence at that time to indicate uh, PSMA PET, although it does get used a lot uh, outside of the United States. Now, as of last week, we obviously edited this and split scenario 10 up into 10 and 11. And obviously, if you have patients who are being considered for uh, PSMA radioligand therapy, PSMA PET's approved. If you are got metastatic disease and you're not being considered for PSMA radioligand therapy, PSMA PET should not be approved. And I just note that scenario 11 is miswritten there. It should say uh, post-treatment rise in the MCRPC setting in patients who are being considered for PSMA RLT. Okay, so uh, in that setting, we've in in updated that with the approval of PSMA 617. And many of these indications will get changed as drugs become approved, right? So if uh, PSMA addition is successful and leads to an approval of PSMA radioligand therapy and metastatic castration sensitive disease, we would update that indication to actually include this. But until those drugs are available, uh, it would not be an appropriate use of PSMA PET. NCCN guidelines break up the uh, staging this way. And it's very similar, in essence, directly matches uh, the SNMMI guidelines, although our guidelines are a little more descriptive of how it should be used uh, and addressed in a little more detail. But what I like about the NCCN guidelines is their phrasing about the use of conventional imaging. I'm not going to read this all out. But NCCN clearly stated, don't get a CT and bone scan. Right? And that's really important because with fluciclovine, they didn't clearly state that. And insurance companies said, we're not paying for anything until you have a negative CT and bone scan. And there's no point in doing that. Right, You're just wasting time. And in essence, if you have oligomets on flu, you know, a CT and bone scan, I still want a PSMA PET. Right? It doesn't actually change whether or not you get the PSMA PET anyway. So I really appreciated the wording they put in there to state that you don't need to do that. So. There's a lot of appropriate use criteria out there. And to me, all of them agree for the use in initial staging and biochemical recurrence, right? So unfavorable intermediate and up, and then also BCR settings. And then there is some disagreement in the MCRPC setting, but that's probably because of the timing of when these were published and they will start to harmonize over time as we move forward. Now we'll quickly talk about standardized reporting. Okay, so the, the, the best one, I like the best, is promise the promise criteria, right? A, Matthias is one of my favorite people. Uh, and it breaks up location, right? So it's like a TNM staging system where you see the disease. You can say it's MIT3, MIN0, et cetera. So you know very quickly in your report, you break it out this way and tell your referring clinician where the disease is. It also includes a uh, expression score, right? So if you have low intermediate high expression, this is helpful in terms of selection for PSMA radioligand therapy, but also for interpreting your confidence as to whether or not an inguinal node or something is positive. And then this is matched up with these incredibly complex set of tables, which I will definitely not go through right now, but if you want to, you can look at the manuscript. And the idea here is that you need higher uptake in regions that are less likely to have prostate cancer. So inguinal nodes would need higher uptake than pelvic nodes in order to be positive, things like that. Um, and then this gives you positive negative disease, et cetera. Now, there's also a criteria called PSMA RADS, which is very, very different. PSMA RADS is if you have a single lesion and I want to know if that's prostate cancer or not, that's what PSMA RADS does, right? So I have a single lesion and then I, again, I'm not going to read through this, but if it has really high uptake in a place where you think it's cancer, that's a PSMA RADS 5. If there's no uptake, it's a PSMA RADS 1 and there's a variation going from 1 through 5, okay? This in and of itself I find actually not very helpful. I would never use this on an individual lesion basis, but it can be, it can be used as an educational tool to think about when you would call something positive or negative. And then these were sort of combined together in my mind in EPSMA. So EPSMA PSMA is in essence taking promise criteria and then sort of adding PSMA RADS to it, but it's not exactly clear how it got combined. So how you would you use the promise criteria and the uh, PSMA RADS, but they they simplified the verbiage of the Likert score in PSMA RADS in the ES, EPSMA implementation. And then they also removed the N1A, N1B verbiage to match uh, TNM staging and just had N1, which is more standard in prostate cancer. Um, so you can also use EPSMA. But in my mind, EPSMA sort of matches promise score anyways. It's just another paper that will get referenced a lot to get eGNMI a higher uh, impact factor.
Okay, how would you use this? This is biochemical recurrence after radiation therapy. You can see a retroperitoneal lymph node there, right? PSMA AVID, it does not have size criteria to meet uh, metastatic disease, so you need to have the PSMA uptake. So it's MI, T0, N1, M1A, right? N1A for a single regional node, that's in promise. It would be N1, I mean, uh, M1 for the extra pelvic nodes. There's a second node down there in the pelvis, and then there's the M1, my apologies. And then in PSMA RADS, it would just be PSMA RADS 4, right? I'm not sure how that's clinically beneficial. I don't think your referring clinician would want to know that per se. So in this setting, I, this is how I find promise to be more helpful uh, in terms of the staging of patients. There's also two criteria for progression, the PPP criteria, which is in essence, do you see a new lesion or not, one or two lesions, and then you combine uh, clinical definitions of progression. And then there's the RECIP1, which is a percent change, right? If you have 30% increase versus a decrease of 20%, sort of trying to be like persist. I find the response criteria, these progression criteria, sort of odd because they're very specific to a clinical setting, right? You would never use this progression criteria in an initial staging patient, right? Uh, but you might use the PPP. So you, we need to be a little more careful when we're developing progression criteria so they're specific to the clinical stage of the patient. If you, this would be more applicable in the setting of you know, a metastatic patient being treated with PSMA radioligand therapy, but I'm not so sure how much additional value there is of this over just straight you know, resist progression. Uh, so it's going to be unclear how these things will be used, but people are starting to publish these uh, without really a lot of... They need to focus more on the clinical application of them. So in summary, first, PSMA PETS approved or appropriate and unfavorable intermediate high and very high risk initial staging in a time of biochemical recurrence, fairly straightforward. It's also appropriate in selecting patients for radio ligand therapy. And then last year, I think these response criteria are really in their early stages, and they really need to be developed thinking about a specific clinical indication and why they're being developed, not just published because we can publish something because PSMA PETS is going to get a lot of references. So hopefully moving forward, we can be more cautious about how we develop and put forward response criteria because we need to be very cognizant of their clinical application. So thank you very much, and we'll go on.